This is Jake Hammond for Distillery Labs. Uh, welcome to our next edition of Whiskey Talks. Um, if you've seen the promotions, we've got a pretty exciting uh, guest with us this evening. Uh, Christopher Ferris from the Peoria Public Library is with us today. Um, we're going to be talking all things, not all things, uh, a lot of things history uh, about the Peoria area. Uh, we'll dive a little bit into um, the early Peoria history, some of our industry stuff, our natural resources, the geography, and of course, talking a little bit about distilling uh, and Peoria's distilling past. So uh, I'll let Chris introduce himself here in a second, but uh, he's done a great job of putting together, we got a little sneak peek of, of what he's prepared, but he's done a great job, as always, of uh, putting together some reference materials and, and some visuals for you to see, because visuals really tell this story, uh, and Chris does a great job of, of storytelling. So without further ado, I'll just introduce you, Chris, and then um, we'll kind of get started and, and run through uh, just kind of a, a laundry list of things around Peoria's history, and you can kind of guide us through. So first, if you wouldn't mind, just providing us a quick introduction. Sure, thank you, Jake. My name is Chris Ferris and I am employed by the Peoria Public Library. I work in the reference department and uh, a subset of that is the local history genealogy room where I spend most of my time researching uh, for patrons, uh, whether it's the public or other entities such as yourself or the city. We have a lot of uh, people who have interest in history all the way from people wanting to find out who lived in their house to census records to photographs. Um, it goes on and on, really. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're honored to have you here. So um, I won't reveal your location, especially when COVID stuff gets in the office. They may try to come find you now that you put that out there. So. <laughs> And ask oh, we're questions. opening back up. That's a thing. Thanks for mentioning that. Oh, yeah. We will be opening to the public again this coming Monday. Ah, fantastic. That's great news. So, so, so your people won't be allowed to uh, linger in the building other than in, uh, if you're doing research in the local history genealogy room. That'll be the only place that you can spend a little more time than others. Okay. Okay. And that's on the lower, first lower level. Is that correct? Yeah, lower level one of the main library downtown. Okay, awesome. All right, well, let's get let's jump in. I know we have a lot to cover. Um, you've prepared quite a bit of really valuable information. So let's walk back. I know we've we've talked about this before, and I'm, I, as we go through too, I'm going to kind of relate this. You know, the whole purpose of this talk is to really uh, a lot of the questions have come up too around people asking, well, why the name Distillery Labs? What does that have to do? Are you guys going to actually distill whiskey and serve whiskey in this place? And that's part of what we're trying to address with this too is just Kind of going back in history, um, talking a little bit about you know what makes us what makes Peoria Peoria uh, and our region the region um, and all those different aspects and, and you put together a great kind of outline for that. So walk us way back um, back to the early days, I guess if you will, from our I guess early Peoria history uh, from the founding of the different you know uh, Fort Crevcore and all those other different things. So why don't you kind of walk us back and start from there? Sure. So uh, Peoria was first um, encountered by Europeans in the 17th century, the late 17th century, and uh, they encountered natives uh, who were living in the Peoria area, and for the most part, they got along. Uh, they visited here, uh, some explorers, and I won't go into all the details of who those were right now for the sake of time, but um, also in the early 17th century, uh, Europeans, uh, the French, started living in the Peoria area. And uh, let me step back just a little bit. Peoria, it, it seems, and there's a little disagreement on this, is probably named after an Indian Native American word that means fat beasts or fat beasts live here. And that kind of speaks to what, uh, some of the first things that I was going to talk about, which is the natural resources, which attracted uh, the Native Americans here and the Europeans because of the uh, proximity to the water, the fresh water, and uh, some uh, good land to grow crops on, and also uh, wildlife that could be hunted. And those were some of the fat beasts, uh, allegedly, that uh, there was good game to be had here. Gotcha. All right. So uh, I know you had some images, and if you wanted to share your screen and show sure. us and kind of walk through um, 
some of those in, and I want to hear your pronunciation of this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We talked about this uh, while we were getting ready. And I yeah. said that I'm not a French speaker. Uh, this is an uh, artist conception of uh, La Ville de Malay. And anybody who's watching that knows better French is welcome to contact me and tell me the right way to say that. Uh, it's supposed to mean Malay's village, who was uh, one of the original French uh, settlers that came to Peoria. He was a trader. And he uh, was, again, there's some disagreement on this, but it sounds like he probably settled uh, further up the lake, uh, not, not very far, if you know where uh, Grant Street is or where Komatsu is in that area, and then moved down to the location of our current uh, downtown area along the river a few years later. And that's, uh, again, an artist's conception of what that might have looked like. Interestingly enough, um, just a side note, something I'm aware of, I know there's a, a big mural or a piece of artwork inside of um, the building where the nest is located that actually has that name uh, painted painted on the wall before you go down the stairs. So I okay. don't know if that's original or, or what, but it's it's got the same name on it. So it's just something interesting along with that. La Ville de, uh, de Malay? Yes. That's the that's name? Right. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. So um, I, don't, I forget which one you had next, but I think it's my favorite one, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. It that's it. <laughs> yeah. So second. yeah, talk about the original layout. Of so um, Alexander Hamilton's son, William Hamilton, uh, came to Peoria to survey the uh, city and lay it out um, in blocks and uh, streets. And he, as you can see here in the uh, shaded area, he laid it out uh, aligned with the river instead of as many um, as we would do it today uh, by the compass, north and south. So. That's something that we will see in later images that changed over time. And even in this one, which was only a few years later, you see an addition um, to the upper left where they started to realign to the compass. You gonna break out in some Hamilton song for us, Chris? <laughs> uh, yeah, we talked about that. No, I, I'm not, uh, not today. In, in that musical, I apologize. <laughs> it's quite all right. <laughs> All right. Um, so the, you also noted something about the naming naming of the streets too, um, and it's kind of hard to see on here. But um, all presidential looks like presidential streets and Water Street. Interestingly, has been Water Street for forever, I guess. Right. Well, it was changed for a time, and then it was changed back. Okay. So so it, it went by a different name for a, a period of time. As other street names have changed and. A lot of that seems to be of interest to a lot of people moving forward into history is why did the streets name change you know over time and mm -hmm. uh we get a lot of questions about streets gotcha gotcha and, and numbering of streets and everything like that right right um i don't know if the next one was that uh back shot from the river that showed the um streets or not but that oh, okay Okay. Go ahead. Yes, yeah. so the natural natural resources, right? Yeah, we we talked a little bit about that earlier, and uh, this is a photograph taken in the early 20th century of Upper Peoria Lake from Grandview Drive, and um, <coughs> this view, as we would still see today, for the most part, is is unspoiled, and it's what attracted a lot of people to Peoria is these these uh, large lakes that were part of the Illinois River itself. And um, something else that I was gonna mention while we were talking about that is that the Illinois River Valley is, is very deep and has tall bluffs. And this is the majesty of those is something that resonated with a lot of the early settlers. And you'll see in newspaper accounts in the early 19th century, people talked about how beautiful Peoria was. And that's one of the, the things that keeps uh, coming decade after decade is that you see people commenting on that. And uh, I promised you a little trivia, Jake. Uh -oh. the, the audience is watching some things they might not know. And this is kind of a spoiler or um, it might make some people uh, unhappy to hear this, but Franklin Roosevelt, or 
Theodore Roosevelt did visit Peoria and was on Grandview Drive, but uh, from everything that I've researched, he did not proclaim it as the world's most beautiful drive. He said something to the effect, and uh, he said it many times, but it wasn't the, weren't those exact words. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I wanted to also talk about the, um, I think I, I touched a little bit on the animals that were in the region and the fact that uh, the soil is very fertile. Something else um, that Peoria had going for it was its proximity to coal deposits. And uh, the water, not only the water that you see here in front of you, but um, the water that was underground and is still underground in the Peoria area. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, where you got your name, of course, uh, and why people came and created distilleries and thought Peoria is a good place to distill uh, alcohol drain alcohol is because of the water that they could get that's filtered through limestone. And I don't know if that's one of the thing in your flow chart of distilling mm -hmm. process, but that's played a big part in Peoria's history. Yep. And we also have, right, we've got the, I mean, assuming part of that is the aquifers, right? The San Cody aquifer and, and those different natural resources. And mm -hmm. I go back to the coal, the coal thing too. I'm a Pekin native and I know that, especially over in Pekin, right, the coal miners park and they have a lot of uh, I actually saw several streets that actually caved in um, on, on top of some of those coal mines uh, and those coal deposits over time that um, that were there. And there's somewhere in, in Pekin, there's a map, right, of all those uh, layouts of how those coal deposits are settled underneath the underneath the city. It's really interesting. And uh, parts of the Peoria Airport are also built over ah. coal, coal mines. I don't know if you knew that or not. I did not. That's very interesting. And it could be potentially uh, dangerous too, uh, had they not foreseen uh, <laughs> the the problems that might be associated with that. Right. Right. So, talk a little bit more um, about the geography, or some more. So, the river, the lakes, the bluffs, those types of things. Well, going back to the river, the um, what made it easy for the early French and other Europeans, and then eventually the Americans to come to Peoria was the fact that the Illinois River was right on its doorstep and um, it provided an easy means when it wasn't easy to travel overland. And of course, there were no hard roads or there were no railroads or any other kind of inland transportation. So, so Peoria, that's one of the reasons that was settled prior uh, to a lot of other areas further east from Peoria because of the access that the Illinois River provided and uh, caused it to be settled and uh, populated quicker than other places in the United States or the early United States. Interesting. Um, talk a little bit, uh, let's see here, Lake Peoria, you mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, what slide next? Oh, okay, uh, speaking of the river, um, I, I want to show you uh, uh, approximately about 1870 view of Peoria here, which shows how it had grown in uh, the short time since it had been settled, like 50 years prior, 40 years prior. And the levee where you see the steamboats landing there and some other flat boats. Uh, and by this time, we had our first bridge uh, two bridges, actually, uh, the one on the right would be the pedestrian bridge or the wagon bridge, as it was called, and the one on the left is a railroad bridge. Okay. I can, you can see in that one too. Oh, sorry. All right, I'll go back. That's okay. I was going to say, you can see in that one too, you've got the, going back to the streets, right, of going along the river, and then in the upper left corner, you can see where they are kind of angled, so. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, and uh, as you may recall, some of those interesting intersections have been changed over the last 50 years. But when I was a kid, they were still very much in place. But when there was some urban renewal in the 60s and 70s, a lot of those were changed. Mm -hmm. And I've got a couple more slides here that show the river and the two bridges we discussed. This is a, the wagon bridge, which actually pivoted to allow for larger vessels to go through because of its height. 
So if you see the stone um, pier it, in, the, in the middle of the first span of the bridge, the bridge mm -hmm. would turn to allow the, the, the steamships to get access past it. And you were saying this one was located, that's the same, where were those that was located where today? So, so those essentially were, um, if you know where Embassy Suites is on the East Peoria side, mm -hmm. that, that, that would have been uh, right next to the Bob Michael Bridge is where that would have come out on the East Peoria side and uh, would have uh, gone to the Peoria side um, in um, essentially across the river from it. Except okay. the, not the railroad bridge, but the, the wagon bridge would have. Gotcha. So the same location we were talking earlier where uh, Franklin Street at one point was at, right next yeah, to- Yeah, eventually they connected Bridge Street, which it was originally called, to Franklin Street. And uh, so, so you would have come straight off, you know, again, the streets did not run north, south, they ran along the river. And so then Franklin Street took a big jog and went north uh, by the compass. And you can kind of see it here in this photograph if you follow the bridge and you, you see how you can only go straight so long before you have to turn because of the change in the, the way that the streets were laid out. Yeah, that's a really interesting picture, yeah. And Peoria continued to grow uh, and grow throughout the uh, 19th century. And this would have been uh, 1880, I believe. Okay. Just real quick question. I know, obviously, there's probably lots of resources, but where where are you getting a majority of your things? Were they have they been at the library the whole time? Are you collecting them from elsewhere? Uh, are people bringing things to you when they find them in their homes? How do you how do you come across a lot of this historical information? Well, the Peoria Public Library has been around for. Um, a long time and over the years we've gained these kind of resources in the way that you described um, donations people um, people specifically historians would create their own documents and then give it to the library we have certain collections uh, photographs for example that somebody might have spent a lifetime collecting and then then later in their life they donate to the library so so we continue to get new donations and uh, all of the materials, except, uh, except for the exception of a couple that I, I got at the Library of Congress uh, for this presentation or from the library. Okay, cool. All right, what do we have next? Into, moving into transportation. Okay, so, so we talked a little bit about uh, why people came to Peoria the River. Um, Peoria became kind of a hub for early roads too. And this um, slide here talks about improving roads. As you, as you look throughout Peoria's history, one of the common themes, and I'm sure it is in many places, is better roads. They always wanted better roads. And, and we'll kind of build up to the ultimate in road here very quickly. So I'll go through the transportation slides. Uh, this shows all the railroads that converge on Peoria in the 19th century. And uh, I think at one time after this, Peoria had, and I'm not an expert in the, the rail history, but approximately 15 railroads coming in, wow. 15 different lines. And uh, it wasn't just, you know, large steam trains that traveled by rail. This is a photograph of the uh, Illinois traction system, which ran, as you can see the car, and imagine uh, riding that car across the river without any, looks like much to hold you in. <laughs> that is a, a draw span and um, that's called the McKinley Bridge. It's no longer there, but that carried passengers via electrified rail. So light <laughs> electrified rail from Peoria, which was the terminal point, to points east and south of here. And it stopped along a lot of the places that we still know today, like East Peoria and um, Morton, and it went as far south as St. Louis. Wow. So you could take that 
and it, it took longer than the steam trains. I remember when I was a kid, my dad told me he took the streetcar to St. Louis. I'm like, you didn't take the streetcar to St. Louis. How could you do that? Why would a streetcar to go to St. Louis? But that's how he described it. That's what he was taking is the, the traction. Okay. So they would do that for the day, you know, when he was a young kid and uh, unattended a different time, I guess. <laughs> so it made it easier for people to commute into the city, actually, yeah, the, the, yeah. the traction did. I'm sorry, go ahead. Doors or windows or anything on it. It's just that like that would be one of the summer cars, so it wasn't enclosed. Okay. You know, of course, they didn't have air conditioning. <laughs> and here's another picture of a, a later photograph of an enclosed car going across the same span. <laughs> and um, about... Yeah, so this, is, this is an interesting chat. I think this is just... Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> About 30 years uh, after that first photograph, the um, passenger train that came to Peoria was this diesel electric locomotive, the Peoria Rocket. And uh, Rock Island Railroad had this train set, which included the engine and the cars. And they had several of them that ran uh, over their lines. And they called them the Rocket because they were fast and efficient. and we talked about today how you could go in a Rock Island rocket, which the Peoria rocket, which ran between Peoria and Chicago um, faster than you could by train today. And um, about the same time that it would take a car today. And that's with stops yeah. on uh, at different stations along the way. So you said they were going, what, 100 plus miles an hour, you said at the time? Not, not always. They didn't necessarily need to to meet their schedule, but they could go over 100 miles an hour. Yes, I've read accounts. I just I just find that interesting, you know, now with Amtrak, right? We don't have a station, you know, in Peoria. There's one in Normal and there's one in Galesburg, but we're now, after being such an important hub for the railroad, um, and especially the passenger railroad, that now we don't have a passenger <laughs> uh, rail line here in Peoria. So. And over the years, there's been a lot of talk about that, which you might recall. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it's a different time where people have easy access to automobiles, not like they do or did then. This would have been from 1937 when this was put into service. But even then, rail was starting to decline, even mm -hmm. as that was put into service, passenger rail, because of improved roads, hard roads, and uh, improved cars. And speaking of transportation, we're going to step back a little bit. And we talked about Peoria being a, a big steamboat center. And when the rails came through in the 1850s, um, the uh, that kind of, just like every new technology does, it uh, allow people to travel quicker and in more different directions than following a river would do. So steamboat traffic decreased during that time after the first railroads arrived. And here you see two very different technologies, uh, a, a hydroplane and a, a steamboat, uh, both existing along the Peoria levee at the same time. And um, Peoria, even before it had an airport, had airplanes flying in Peoria. Now, this was the first airplane to fly in Peoria, and it flew at the site of where the Peoria Stadium is today. There used to be there in the early 20th century National Exposition where they'd have car races and they'd have uh, exhibitions like this. Plane was brought in on rails to fly in Peoria and then taken somewhere else. So okay. that was Peoria's, many Peorians, tens of thousands of them saw this fly in Peoria. It was a big event. When and, was that? Uh, what, yeah, when was that year wise? That first uh, plane in Peoria was, I think it was 1910 or 11. I don't have that in front of me, so I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. uh, my high school uh, history teacher, who was a big mentor to me, said it's more important to understand the significance of an event than the date. So I use that as an excuse when I don't remember the date. <laughs> this okay. this is a um, an advertisement for that national implement show that we were talking about. So 
and, and it truly was national. This was uh, an event that people came from all of the United States to attend. So it was a big deal for Peoria. Very cool. And here's another photograph of um, a hydroplane on the Illinois, flying over the Illinois River. Very cool. Okay, and uh, then we fast forward to um, very new technology as compared to um, some of the things that we saw earlier in this presentation, which is the Bob Michael Bridge under, or the Murray Baker Bridge under construction, which brought the interstate to Peoria eventually. And uh, it was good and bad for Peoria because it made it easier for people to come to Peoria and to leave Peoria and to move out to the suburbs too, the outlying areas. It takes me, uh, I, I probably shouldn't say this since I work for the Peoria Public Library, but I don't live in Peoria, but I live in a suburb of Peoria and it takes me 12 minutes from my door to the library store to get in and out of Peoria. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that just real, just real quickly back on on the Mary Baker, of course, with the recent you know renovation and everything that was going on, that at the time too, that was a major national connection too, right? Of connecting the you know the two sides of the river, and, and I remember that uh, article that you had shared with me that we had hanging down in Peoria made about this about it being the gateway to the great or to the Midwest type of thing. So up until that point, there really wasn't an easy way, I guess, from interstate wise, right, to get from that side of the river over to the other and, and, make, and travel west or east. Well, you're right. This was new throughout the United States as the interstate started to come through and um, mm -hmm. they were put in place for a variety of reasons. And um, one of those was national defense to be able to move troops from <clears throat> one place to another quickly. And the other one was because they were considered safer, more efficient roads. Simple as that. And uh, there's a big debate in a lot of cities as to where to put the interstate when it came to your city, if it did. So some would decry the interstate today, especially that it ruined a lot of American cities, but it is what it is, right? It's here and uh, in retrospect, or from this perspective, I think it's good that Peoria put it on the periphery of their downtown area and they didn't elevate it above, you know, the streets, they, they depressed it below grade. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it really provides a, an attractive entry into the city, you know, to, again, talking about that beauty. So when you come down from um, the Heights from Tazewell County into Peoria, even even to um, us people who have jaded eyes who have lived here forever, it's still kind of a sight, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know coming from 116 down Germantown Hills is always impressive. Coming from 74, when you come around that corner is always impressive. I think I think I had somebody, I forget who it was that came into town and rather than coming you know, straight from the airport, we went around 474 in order to come down 74, just to get that, like you're saying, that beauty when you come in. And I think with the lights and the addition of the lights, um, some of the pictures I've seen, I mean, I've seen it in person, but some of the pictures really paint a great picture of, of the downtown scene now, so. Yeah, you're talking about the, the new lights on the Murray Baker Bridge. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that does really add to the beauty, I agree. Absolutely. All right, so let's talk a little bit about industry. Um, oh, you still got it, oh, keep going, oh, sorry. sorry. About this one. Uh, just wanted to cover quickly that uh, Peoria did get jet service in the 1960s. Uh, via Ozark Airlines, which some old timers will remember. And uh, here's a couple of those Ozark jets at the Peoria Airport. And uh, then we can move on to industry. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, just real quick on the Ozark thing. I, I don't know when that went away or when they left. I think I remember that from when I was a kid and back in the 80s. I, I think it was still here, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah. And uh, if I remember, and as I told you earlier, I'm not what I consider an expert on Peoria history. I'm still learning along with my students, but uh, I am a student uh, of, of Peoria's history and I can't answer that question. So I can look it up for you and give you the answer later. I think you're right though about the yeah. timing. Yeah. 
All right. So yes, let's talk a little bit about industry. We'll spend some time on the uh, distilling side of things and let's see where we see where we get. Okay. So we touched on distilling and why Peoria became a distilling center a little bit earlier because of, well, the, the water, mm -hmm. the proximity of all the corn and other grains being grown in the area and um, the coal to fire these distilling industries. So those are all important. So Peoria, as I will show you here in a second, started off, this is a early entry into the city directory showing that there were a handful of distillers, including one who's connected to uh, the founder of Bradley University, mm -hmm. where some money came from to help with that founding. Um, those continued to grow and not only grow in the number of distillers, but the the size of the distilleries and the size of the industry between, um, I've got a little fact here, I'll read to you. Okay. Between 1869 and 1885, the city's distilleries produced over 190 million gallons of grain alcohol. These numbers illustrated that Puri was indeed the center of distilling for the entire country and provided the majority of liquor tax revenue as well. So, this is when Peoria in its uh, heyday in the late 19th century, early 20th century was the whiskey capital of the world. Our first capital, you know, we've talked about the different capitals Peoria has been. So this is when it became the whiskey capital up until prohibition was enacted, which uh, put an end to alcohol for consumption, but there was still alcohol being made like industrial mm -hmm. alcohol, which uh, at one time Peoria kind of wanted to be the industrial alcohol capital, you know, after they lost the title of whiskey capital or the, for the food stuff kind of alcohol. Mm -hmm. You had a question, I think, earlier about this. I don't remember what it was now. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, so, so that was a big industry. It went away for a while, but as soon as prohibition was repealed, it was back. And um, a gentleman named William Hull, who was a congressman at one time, um, an entrepreneur, uh, he had his hands in a lot of things. Well, one of them was in attracting Highworm Walker, which many of us know who lived in Peoria, which was around again until like the early eighties was, um, became the largest distillery in the world. And it held that title for a while. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, we only have craft distilleries here now. I think uh, we've got a couple or two or three in operation. You might know that better than me. I'm not, uh, if Chris said he's on, he's, he's probably knows a little better than I, but I do know that we have um, Black Band, which is coming online. And then JK Williams is going through a uh, um, relaunch as well. So those are the two I'm aware of at the moment. So I've got a few images here of the whiskey capital of the world. This one from the late 19th century, which shows an area south of the current Bob Michael Bridge. Uh, and you can see, and these aren't all smokestacks associated with the uh, production of alcohol, but a lot of them are. And as far as the eye can see, south towards Bartonville. In that thing, sorry, go back real quick. You were mentioning yeah. that uh, round uh, container in the middle there. Can you tell us what that was about? That's really interesting. So my understanding was that was the Peoria Gas Works where they turned coal into gas. Uh, and I'm not sure of the process of that, but as the gas would be extracted that bladder in the metal framework would fill up too, it was full. And that was used for, uh, I believe mainly, and I haven't done a lot of research on this, to bring gas to people's houses for lighting, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Okay. I just, I just enter this picture is very, in my uh, opinion, this picture is just interesting, kind of showing what you were talking about, just all those different, you know, 
aspects, geography aspects kind of coming together, right? Being on the river for the transportation, um, you know, utilizing the natural resources and, and that with the, with the water and it's just a really interesting um, an image that kind of brings all that together. Not, not quite as beautiful as our natural beauty that we were talking about earlier. True. Sure. But if you're a capitalist, you might find that very beautiful, <laughs> especially if you're ahead of the largest whiskey trust in the United States. Um, Smells like money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here's pure advertising on the side of a steamboat. It's uh, money that it's brought into Uncle Sam's coffers. Uh, they say that Peoria helped finance most of the Civil War by the taxes that they, their industry paid in the alcohol production. I've never, I've not researched that either to find out if it's actually true or not. But it sounds that? right. There, that's uh, trying to see how many zeros. Thirty. I can't tell, 35 million at the time, looks like. They're too small for me to count from here. <laughs> I think you're right though. And uh, we talked about, again, the second birth of distilling in Peoria. And here's a photograph from the period uh, when Hiram Walker would have first gone online. And it's still, that structure is still there. It's ADM uh, next to the Cedar Street Bridge. A bunch of the building, many of the buildings are there. Some have been torn down. I know for a fact, um, just go, um, the Cooperage building on Pecan um, held a lot of those empty whiskey barrels uh, mm -hmm. at, one, at one point as well. I know there's a display when you walk into the entry there with, with whiskey barrels, and that's what that uh, building was primarily used for back in the day for storage. Those maybe, maybe not just for Hiram, but just for the industry in general. Uh, yeah, certainly there were a lot of ancillary industries that mm -hmm. came up around the production of, of whiskey, you know, portage and uh, barrel making, as you talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people were employed in pure area, but, and we're gonna talk about this very soon, uh, Peoria wasn't a, a one industry town. Uh, some might argue that it was, but my research showed me that's not the case. Now, granted, some of that was because of the industries that sprang up along with these major industries. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit about beer and for the same reasons distilling was successful here. We had brewing, um, the Gips, which was a local beer up through the 1950s. This facility was near the current day Bob Michael Bridge on the Peoria side. That previous one we said was uh, PMP, correct? Or at the location where PMP is at? The, the, this, this, some of these structures, yeah, still exist today. The Lysi Beer uh, facilities down here along Water Street by the river are now today PMP. Gotcha. Which, um, was uh, later owned by Pabst. And um, we also have a photograph here of Pabst Brewing Company that was located in Peoria Heights. And uh, they made several additions throughout the, the years that they were in production there from post prohibition onward. Again, seems like a lot of things uh, in the late seventies and early eighties kind of came to an end as we talk about some of these old pictures here. And, that was another one of them. And uh, frankly, it left, no pun intended, a sour taste in a lot of people's mouth, I think, especially when they left. Mm -hmm. But we still have some of the original structures today and they're being reused. Yes. Including this building right here. Okay, and going on from um, production of alcohol, this is, uh, sorry about that. This is the Duryea Motor Trap, which was conceived in Peoria, but not mass manufactured here. And uh, we have one of we have uh, an example of this today in our Riverfront Museum. That you, you've probably seen it. it. Used to be here at the Peoria Public Library downtown on display. But Peoria did have a manufacturing industry that centered around automobiles and trucks. Uh, to some extent, and other implements, um, 
farm implements, the Avery factory, which is today, again, where we talked about became, I don't know if we talked about that yet or not, but uh, the Wabco facilities. And a few years ago, they tore down some of the old factories and now there's a berm there along uh, South Adams or North Adams Street. Uh, Peoria was a big uh, manufacturer of bicycles and um, there was also a very popular sport for a time in the late 19th century as this picture of the Peoria, one of the Peoria Bicycle Clubs attests to. Imagine riding those on that, that kind of road bed. <laughs> And um, of course, something that's still with us today is the Caterpillar tractor, which was brought here in the early 20th century. And Murray Baker, who we mentioned, uh, was a part of that in tracking them to Peoria, Holt Manufacturing, to make tractors in Peoria because there was a vacant factory in the East Peoria side of the river that they used to start their facilities. Uh, this is a picture of a Whole tractor grading, pulling a grader that um, the road that became Caterpillar Trail across the river. It was um, something Murray Baker wanted to do for the community and also it helped to get Caterpillar some advertising, mm -hmm. showing what their equipment could do. We talked a lot about Wabco or Komatsu, mm -hmm. what is now Komatsu, and it was uh, originally some of the Avery works, which you see the older factories here above the long factory in the foreground. The um, R.G. Laterno, who is an industrialist, an inventor, an engineer, he located in Peoria because a lot of uh, the equipment he built, which were graders and scrapers and things of that nature for road building, uh, and bulldozer blades, things of that nature, were uh, were used with the cat association with the Caterpillar tractor. So he wanted to be here close to Caterpillar, and uh, that industry still survives today. And some of the equipment they build there, including the heavy mining trucks that they do, so you uh, maybe see sometimes go along the river uh, on the flatbeds of rail cars. So Peoria is still. Um, shipping out products and Caterpillar as well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we've got about 10-ish minutes left. Okay. Um, I know we wouldn't get through all of it, but there's lots more to go. But I think the note, I'm just looking at your notes too, and I think you mentioned this before, and I think it's an important one to bring up, um, this diversification thing, right, where you said kind of the thought of predominantly in the 20th century for distilling and earth moving products, Pure has always manufactured at wide variety of goods and materials. And you mentioned that earlier, that we haven't always been just a, say a one trick pony, if you will, but we've always been making things. Um, we've always been innovating. We've always, you know, kind of had new ideas and we haven't even, we didn't even get to talk about, you know, the science side of things and engineering and the ag lab and all those types of things. But um, what kind of is your generalization, just kind of recapping what you had said before, just around, uh, the, I guess the diversity, right, of our economy over over the years, at least with what you've researched and studied. Well, I can't, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that the last few days, knowing that I was going to be preparing for this, I boned up a lot on some anecdotal and um, information that was in our vertical file material that we have arranged by a decade that uh, talks about the description of Peoria, how Peoria described itself and how others described it, uh, newspapers from other cities. And the thing that really resonated with me more so than in the past is that people describe Peoria as, yeah, it was one time a whiskey capital. And it became the earth moving capital with more and more people working in the heavy earth moving industry for Caterpillar and for places like Komatsu. However, the thing that was mentioned that stood out to me is even though at one time Caterpillar, you know, employed over 20,000 people, that was 
there were many more people who lived in Peoria and they worked in different locations in smaller industrial locations, of course, service industry. Um, some of the places, uh, because of the fact that Peoria was a rail hub and uh, located along the river and the other transportation aspects that benefited the Peoria area, I say still do today, would be our warehouse district, which uh, this Wilson Grocery a building is still there today is an example of. There would be warehouses where materials to be delivered along with other industrial uh, centers that were making different kinds of equipment that used Peoria as a place to ship from to the United States, whether the East or West Coast. And something I forgot to mention earlier is Peoria was early connected to the Transcontinental Railroad. So you could send things from Peoria's factories or warehouses regionally or nationally. Another example is what we today know as uh, 401 Water. And it was originally built as a Larkin warehouse. Larkin was kind of a forerunner to like uh, Amazon because they had all these different things they offered. They started off um, doing soap and then they branched out into many different things, shipping these things uh, and then mailing them to people's houses. Uh, but as you can see here, there's a rail yard right connected to the Larkin company. So, so these, uh, a lot of the Larkin factories, uh, to my understanding, were located in Buffalo, New York, and then they were shipped out to their warehouses throughout the country. And Peoria was a hub for one of those warehouses. Uh, this factory produced clothing, uh, especially a line of clothing known as Princess Peggy, which was women's house dresses and aprons and things of that nature, a building that's still standing today, not making those kind of uh, items anymore. <laughs> you know, it's uh, been sitting empty for a while. <laughs> the Denison Bottle Company was uh, located where um, Zion Coffee is. And um, as you can see, they're advertising the kinds of materials that uh, they made there. It was in that uh, that block there in the building where Zion is. Okay. Uh, Altorfer Brothers Company made uh, washing machines. <laughs> you can still see some of these. Uh, and a lot of the industry that Peoria had, examples of those, I should give a shout out to the Wheels of Time Museum. If you want to see Peoria's past and their industrial past, stop out there because they have great examples of materials uh, of, that were produced in Peoria. Absolutely. So these are just a few of the examples of the diversification. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got, I want to just run through real quick. If you don't mind, stop share. I'm going to run through real quickly. Yeah, sure. A couple slides and then got to hop off for uh, the mayoral forum coming up at, uh, at six o'clock. So okay. we wanted to kind of tie together this presentation, which has been fantastic just around the history side and uh, the branding of Distillery Labs. So what I want to, this is the, uh, probably only time peak of this that uh, anyone will see, but these are the some of the logo concepts that were generated for um, the beginning of or for, before the final logo was determined um, that it, we created for for Distillery Lab. So with this one with the nod to the wheat, you know the whiskey. Oops. This one had a little bit more of a nod to the, the kind of the pill, but also the science side of things, the medical side of things, the you know the history, the medical history of Peoria. Uh, this was another one that was a little bit com combination of a um, whiskey. Um, I forget the name of it. There's a, a scientific term for some of this stuff, uh, and some and different color scheme. This one more around ideas, the typeface being. Uh, a little bit more retro. And then the one we landed on, of course, was, was this one that was really a nod and, and kind of harkens back to that historic nature with the type and the colors and the styling and everything. So I, I don't have enough time to go into all the details behind why, but um, that's kind of the, the reasoning behind um, this one, why it was chosen uh, and really related to a lot of the history that you talked about. And what I wanted to spend just a couple a couple seconds on too, and we're continuing to put this out onto Instagram um, over in, in the various social media channels. 
Uh, this was actually a historical document, not from Peoria that I found, but found it through a Google archive search of distilling of ideas. They actually took whiskey distilling process and actually applied it to how innovation works. Um, and that's what you kind of see represented here within this graphic of the different steps in, in the whiskey distilling process and how they actually apply to the creation of ideas and in, in the formulation of, of innovation and in, in companies. So if you get a chance, go check that out. Um, we're on step four, I believe, just finished step four on social media. Uh, and we'll be continuing to finish those out every Friday uh, on the different channels. So uh, Chris, it's been a blast. Thank you for joining us. Um, I know you've got more. So I think we're gonna to have to get you back on the schedule to do another one of these um, and finish up what you had prepared because I know you spent a bunch of time on this and it was super informative and, and super awesome to hear. So thanks for your time. Um, we appreciate it. Uh, once again, Chris is in lower level one at the main branch of the public library and you guys are opening up again when? This coming Monday. Okay, so this coming Monday, you can go check that out, explore the collection if you have any questions. Um, Chris is a great resource and uh, always has always been very willing um, and uh, able to help uh, when anybody's had any requests. So thank you, Chris. Thank you for everyone for attending again um, this evening. And uh, we'll record this. It'll be up on the Distillery Labs website uh, and through our social media channels. And we'll hope to see you again for the next one in just a couple of weeks. Have a great evening. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.